Again. And uh, so welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm sure this is going to be a really uh, interesting morning and, and it works really neatly with our first year course, Jewish Life and Death in Europe, um, and also our MA program as well. So to introduce Gillian, who I've known um, for some years, uh, I think it was probably late 1980s yeah. that we worked together when Gillian um, was at the forefront of, of um, creating the Anne Frank Educational Trust uh, in the UK. Uh, I worked on the um, traveling exhibition by the international branch of the Anne Frank uh, House, uh, which was a wonderful traveling exhibition, Anne Frank in the World, which went to Manchester, but it also went to Bournemouth where, where Gillian was based at that time. Uh, and from that, uh, and Julia will say more, uh, the Anne Frank Trust uh, was created and it had a strong sort of Wessex connection of people in, in, in Bournemouth, Southampton and, and Winchester. Um, and from those very sort of humble origins and working very closely with the international branch, um, Julian uh, brilliantly sort of created this, this national body which has, has gained so much recognition. So she worked with, the, with the, uh, creating the trust and, and bringing it into lots of different areas as we'll hear. Um, more recently, she, she's retired, but she's still very, very active in giving lectures, uh, including um, on the history of the afternoon tea in England. Um, but alas, we will not be having our slices of lemon and, uh, and, and polite cake this morning. Um, Gillian has uh, written recently uh, a book, The Legacy of Anne Frank, uh, and I would really rec recommend it to you if, if you're interested in what sort of happens to the diary and the story of Anne Frank. Uh, on a very sort of global level uh, beyond 1945, and we'll hear some of that today. So I'm really uh, pleased that Gillian's able to join us this morning, uh, and she'll be giving a sort of illustrated lecture, and we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, and answers afterwards. So please just ask Gillian whatever you, uh, comes to you. Uh, she really values those comments, so, so, so don't be shy afterwards. Okay, Gillian. Thank you so much, Tony. It's lovely to be with you in Southampton. Um, as Tony explained, I'm originally a Bournemouth girl, uh, so I know Southampton very well. But um, what I'm going to do first is the technical bit, and I'm going to share the screen with my presentation and take the slides from the beginning. So hopefully you can hear me, and hopefully you can see a, bl uh, a blue screen uh, filling your computer screen or, or whatever uh, uh, device you've got um, with a, a photograph of Anne Frank. And I hope, by the way, you've got your suitcases packed because the second half of my talk, I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of the world. As Tony just alluded to, um, I'm going to share with you the incredible impact that learning about Anne Frank um, has had and is still having on really some of the world's most um, surprising and turbulent and violent regions. Uh, also, as Tony mentioned, um, we have just marked the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Anne Frank Trust. It was originally called the Anne Frank Educational Trust. We shortened it in about 2000 um, to the Anne Frank Trust UK. And um, Marking 30 years has been quite an emotional <laughs> period for me because it all started in my home. It all started um, from my study in Wimborne in Dorset, not a million miles from Southampton. So um, I'm going to share all about that with you a little bit further on. Um, but first of all, I can't really tell you about Anne and her legacy without talking about this gentleman. And I always say, when I, particularly when I'm standing in front of an audience, I wouldn't be here with you today if it weren't for him, because he, it's his vision that is our inspiration for all the work. And this is, of course, Anne's father, Otto Frank. Now, uh, the photograph on the left, you can see Otto as a young man with his two adored daughters, Margot on the left and Anne on the right. And on the right, you can see Otto as an elderly man after the war, after uh, his liberation from Auschwitz and the new life he had to create for himself without his family. 
So he is incredibly important in the story. And Otto um, was actually born in Frankfurt in 1889. I always say the same year as Hitler, but the two men who were direct contemporaries uh, chose to do completely different things with their lives. They, they both affected millions of people. Hitler uh, for, in, in a negative way, but Otto Frank in a highly positive way. Now, he was born into um, quite an affluent family who had actually come out of the Frankfurt Jewish ghetto about 100 years before his birth. And by the late 1800s, when he was born, along with his sister and two brothers, the family was so well um, inculcated into Frankfurt society that his father, Michael Frank, didn't just work in a bank. He actually owned a bank, the Michael Frank Investment Bank. And so they were a highly regarded family in Frankfurt. Uh, even the Kaiser banked with the Michael Frank Bank. So you can see the sort of comfortability and affluence that Otto was born into. Now, in um, 19, uh, early 1900s, Otto went to Heidelberg University to study business and economics. And there he actually met a young American called Nathan Strauss Jr. Nathan Strauss Jr., uh, his father, owned a rather well-known department store in New York called Macy's. You may just have heard of it and um, invited Otto to come over to New York in the summer of 1908 to actually do work experience in his father's company. So Otto sailed across uh, the Atlantic from Europe in the, those early years of the 20th century, hit New York and absolutely fell in love with it. He loved the brashness, the opportunity that he saw in this vibrant new country and city with its great skyscrapers. And actually this photograph on the right, I took myself because I do quite a bit of uh, work in New York under normal times. I work closely with the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect and as, as an advisor and an ambassador. So um, when I'm in New York, I always make a point of going into Macy's and usually through this very doorway because I took this photo myself because this is the very doorway that young Otto Frank with all the hope of his life ahead of him would have gone into Macy's to do his work experience. Probably Otto may well have stayed in New York um, or even any other part of America because he loved it. Had not in 1909, his father, Michael Frank, died very suddenly. And so Otto was called back to run the family bank. Now, uh, he wasn't a born banker. He was a much more successful small businessman, but nonetheless, he felt his uh, duty to help with running the bank. But that didn't last for very long because in 1914, of course, his life changed. He was called up for the First World War. And um, of course, he fought for Germany. He was very patriotic and he was a very valiant soldier. So much so that um, by the end of the war, he'd been promoted to the rank of lieutenant and had been awarded the Iron Cross for bravery. Of course, this didn't help him some 20 years later. By the mid 1920s in the post-war uh, economic situation in Germany, the bank really was floundering. It was on its last legs. Uh, in 1925, he met and very quickly, after two months of knowing her, married Edith Hollander, who was the daughter of a wealthy industrialist from Aachen in Germany. So by this time, the Frank family had actually lost their fortune, but nonetheless, they, the family still had a st high status and regard in Germany. So uh, even though, uh, Edith wasn't marrying into a wealthy family anymore. Uh, her father was still agreeable to her marrying Otto Frank because of the family name. They had a lovely society wedding and then they went off to San Remo for their honeymoon. Uh, the following year on the 16th of February, uh, their first daughter, Margot Betty was born, a beautiful little dark eyed, dark haired girl. 
And you can see this lovely baby photo of her. And three years later, on the 12th of June, 1929, their second daughter, Annalise Marie, arrived. Uh, her name was soon shortened to Anne, as we, uh, as we know her, but of course by them pronounced in the continental way of Anna. I think this is a particularly poignant photo of little Anna lying in her bed, probably about three, three to four years old, sleeping so innocently, not knowing what life awaits her. Now, I'm not going to go into the details, of course, of why the family had to flee Germany in 1933. But suffice to say that by the end of 1933, remember Hitler had been appointed chancellor in January of that year, and uh, the Nazi party were elected into office in April of that year and soon started dismantling all forms of democracy and bringing in measures against the Jews. By the end of that year, Otto felt that there was no future uh, for his family in Germany, the land of seven generations of his forefathers where they had uh, done so successfully. And uh, he went on ahead of the family to uh, this apartment block in uh, Merveda Plain in the south of the city. Now, there were several reasons he chose to go to Amsterdam. Um, Firstly, on a more general, uh, for a more general reason, uh, the Netherlands, a neighboring country, had been uh, impartial, had been neutral in World War I. So he felt that it would be safe from invasion uh, from the, their neighbors, the Germans. Uh, it had a long history of toleration of other faiths. So, for example, after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in the fifteenth uh, and sixth, uh, this uh, sorry, the fourteenth and the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, many Jews had found their way to Amsterdam and really helped build the uh, city into the great trading city that became in the seventeenth century, the great merchant trading city. On a more pragmatic um, basis, Otto knew the city because he'd done some um, business there. He traveled a few times already to Amsterdam and knew it. But also his brother-in-law who lived in Switzerland worked for a German company called Opecta, which manufactured pectin, which is a natural setting agent for jam, which was home, uh, making jam at home was very popular in uh, the Netherlands and all over Europe in the 1930s. They would pick their fruit seasonally and bottle it for the winter. So pectin was a real business op opportunity, a real opening. So he went and opened an office there uh, for the German company who were looking for an agent to open a branch in uh, Amsterdam. So that all kind of fell into place. And so the Maveda Plain, he chose the Maveda Plain in the south of the city. And by the way, you can go and visit it if you go to Amsterdam. And there's a plaque on the wall of where the Frank family apartment is. Um, because uh, quite a few German Jewish and Austrian Jewish refugees had already started living there. And so they formed like an, a support network for each other. And it was built around a big triangular green area where the children could play and they got to know each other. Possibly also what attracted him to it was the building you can see at the back, which is probably the nearest thing Amsterdam had and still has to um, a New York skyscraper. So the statue, by the way, of course, wasn't put up in the 1930s when Anne lived there. No one knew who she was. It was actually put up um, by the local bookstore around the corner uh, where Anne had actually spotted and Otto had bought the little red check diary that she's seen in the window. And that was a gift for her 13th birthday. I'm sure you know all about that. Now, um, Anne had a lovely childhood in Amsterdam growing up. Uh, she had lots of friends, she was very gregarious, and um, she uh, had a wide circle of friends. So I'm just gonna show you as an example of her circle of friends. This picture was actually taken on her 10th birthday on the 12th of June, 1939. Of course, it wasn't colored by uh, the photographer Otto Frank because um, he wouldn't have used color photography. By the way, uh, I just want to quickly add that the reason we have so many beautiful photographs of Anne and Margot growing up 
is because Otto was a very keen photographer. He purchased a Leica camera, a very good camera in the 1920s. And his twin passions became his two daughters and taking photographs of them. He loved quite creative artistic photography. And so this photograph actually was colored by someone online and I found it and I use it in my talks because I just feel it brings to life these girls who lived, you know, a long time ago, but they become real and you can see uh, how vivid their, their little party dresses are. Now it's an interesting picture because um, you probably spot Anne in the little green dress, she's second from the left. Uh, on the uh, far left of the picture is her very good friend, Jacqueline Van Marsen, who uh, is still alive, direct contemporary of Anne, she'll be 92 this year, still lives in Amsterdam, and I've met her several times. Uh, the little girl next to Anne on the right is her very good friend, um, Hannah, uh, sorry, Susanna Lederman. And uh, Susanna was a very sweet girl. I've met her, her sister, Barbara. But sadly, uh, Susanna and her family were arrested in uh, 1943, deported to Auschwitz, and little Susanna was gassed on arrival, although her uh, sister did survive. The slightly taller girl uh, next to Susanna is Hannah Pick Gosler, and she actually survived Bergen-Belsen, and she's mentioned in Anne's diary quite a bit. And she still lives in Jerusalem, and again, I've met her several times. Now the five girls on the right of the picture are Anne's non-Jewish friends because she had a wide circle of friends. She was very gregarious and outgoing. Interestingly, the tall girl in the middle, by the time this lovely picture was taken, her father had already joined the Dutch Nazi party. Now, um, just 11 months after that photograph was taken, the unthinkable happened and uh, on the 10th of May, 1940, the Germans bomb the city of Rotterdam. There are five days of intensive bombing. Rotterdam is absolutely flattened. If you visit Rotterdam now, you'll find a very different feel to the city than if you, for example, go to Delft or Amsterdam, where you still see these wonderful 17th century merchant houses, trading houses. Um, but Rotterdam was basically rebuilt after the war and is a very modern city. There's a very, very small uh, old area. Uh, the Dutch capitulate after the bombing of Rotterdam and uh, the Germans march in. And of course, measures against the Jews are brought in incre incrementally, which Anne describes very vividly, actually, in her diary when she writes in 1940 when she writes in 1942. Uh, she writes about how the life, her life changes. She can no longer go to the cinema. She can no longer go to athletic fields or swimming pools. She has to wear the yellow star. So her life has changed. And uh, again, you've studied the story of Anne Frank so that you know that the family went into hiding on the 6th of July, 1942, after a call up notice for deportation to a work camp in the East for 16 year old Margot. They flee into hiding uh, the following day. And, and then just as uh, in the summer of 1944, after D-Day, hope is building in the secret annex. Then uh, on the 4th of August, they uh, they, uh, the family and other, the other four people in hiding with them are betrayed, they are arrested. They are taken first for interrogation down to the Gestapo office in the south of Amsterdam. They're interrogated for two days. They are put on a, a train to um, Auschwitz. Tragically, the very last transport out of the Netherlands to Auschwitz. Had the families been arrested, perhaps a month later, they would never have been on that train. And then in late October, Margot and Anne are separated from their mother and transported onto Bergen-Belsen, where they spend a terrible winter of cold and hunger. The camp is riddled with waves of the deadly disease of typhus. Margot dies, and perhaps a day or so, we're not quite sure of the actual time frame because it's very difficult to know. A day or so later, 
and dies as well. This is all uh, uh, through witness testimony. We know this. Um, by the time the two girls have died of, of the terrible death of starvation and disease, ironically, their father has already been liberated from Auschwitz on the 27th of uh, January. We don't know exactly what date the two girls died. Um, it could have been in February, it could have been in March, but all we know, uh, it was very uh, soon before the camp was liberated uh, by, the, um, by the Americans and the British on April the 15th in 1945. So if they could, they knew their father was still alive, it could have given them the strength, the moral strength to carry on, but uh, it was impossible. I just want to mention the gravestone actually in Bergen-Belsen because of course <laughs> uh, the victims in Bergen-Belsen didn't have gravestones erected at the time. They, the, the little bodies were just thrown into a mass pit of thousands. But um, this was actually erected rather recently uh, by their cousin, Anne and Margot's cousin in Switzerland, Buddy Elias, who was the president of the Anne Frank Foundation in Switzerland. And um, uh, he was a good friend. I, I was privileged to know him very well. He died about three or four years ago, and he arranged for this gravestone to be put there. Now, as I mentioned, um, Otto Frank has been liberated on the 27th of January. And by the time the girls are laying dying in Bergen-Belsen, Otto is making the tortuous journey back to Amsterdam. Now, remember that uh, Western Europe was still under war. And uh, so it took a full five months for Otto to actually get back to Amsterdam. Uh, what was he to do? Um, he had nowhere to go. The Mervedepain, the Mervedepain uh, flat had actually been requisitioned uh, once the family had left it to go into hiding in 1942 and actually allocated to a Nazi sympathizing Dutch family. So uh, having arrived back in Amsterdam in June 1945, he goes to live with Miep Hees, uh, who was his administrator and one of the helpers of the family in hiding. And her husband, Jan, uh, Jan Gies was very active in the Dutch resistance. So these were uh, people that he trusted implicitly. implicitly. And then he spends the next uh, few weeks trying to find out exactly what's happened to his daughters. Now he knew that his wife Edith had um, died in Auschwitz on the 6th of January, just three weeks before its liberation by the um, Russians. But he was desperate for news of his daughters because he felt there was a good chance that they would have survived. They were young and uh, during the two years before the arrest, they had been relatively well fed. So um, he puts an advertisement in the local newspaper uh, appealing for any news of his daughters. He does go and visit two sisters who were with them in Bergen-Belsen in their last days. And they report informally to him that his two daughters died in Bergen-Belsen. They actually saw them, they were in the same bar barracks and they actually took the bodies away. But it hadn't been confirmed. And it was only uh, a few days later that he's in his office working because he went back into the business, uh, that a telegram arrives from the Red Cross confirming that his two daughters have died. Now Meep, actually, who's working in the office, uh, Otto goes out and says to Meep, Meep, the girls are no more. And with that, Meep goes actually to the drawer of her desk where she has been saving that little red check diary for Anne. And she hands it to Otto and she says, here you are, Mr. Frank, here is the testament of your daughter. Now Meep had very bravely broken into the hiding place, uh, broken the lock after the families had been arrested and rescued the little red check diary and all Anne's other writing and papers in the hope that 
uh, and would soon come back because of course the allies were already approaching, unfortunately not fast enough. And Otto goes away and reads the diary and um, he discovers the hidden depths of his daughter that even though he was living with her 24 seven, he really hadn't understood because you know to the in front of the adults Anne had a demeanor of being a very precocious very unusual for a German born girl and feisty girl she was very intelligent and she had an answer for everything um and when he read perhaps the later entries into her diary he realized that this teenage girl had was developing a moral framework a responsibility for uh, the world that he really hadn't known. The other daughter, Margot, the older daughter, was the studious girl, the academic girl, the quiet girl that seemed to have all the hidden depths and the great potential. Uh, but in fact, when he read Anne's diary, he realized the true depths of his teenage daughter. Now, when he read the diary, Otto was faced with a moral dilemma. And that was because um, he knew that his daughter, as greatest wish, was to have been uh, a writer. But uh, there was a, a dilemma involved in this because in the diary, Anne had actually written not very favorably, not very kindly about her mother, even about her sister, because there was great sibling rivalry. But uh, also about the other people in hiding. That was the Van Pels family and their son, Peter, with whom she had a sort of very brief sort of uh, romance, teenage romance. And also particularly uh, Fritz Pfeffer, who she was forced to share a room with. And uh, this caused her a, a lot of anguish and grief, particularly as he snored, but also he was a strict disciplinarian. And she, he really was very, very poorly written about in the diary. Um, I'm just going to uh, show you this picture because um, I've mentioned Meep a few times already. And I had the great privilege of knowing Meep in the 1990s and 2000s and spending quite a bit of time with her, including going to her apartment uh, in Southern Amsterdam where she showed me some of the items uh, from the secret hiding place. Um, and that was us actually in the 1990s, um, looking a bit younger there, uh, in Anne's bedroom. Now she was an absolutely remarkable woman. She lived to be a hundred. She died in 2010 at the age of nearly, very nearly 101. But you know something, till the day she died, she still held this incredible guilt feeling that she couldn't do more to save the Frank family and the others in hiding. And uh, Meep and I in 1996, we had the incredible experience of attending the Oscar ceremony in Hollywood, uh, the 1996 Academy Award, where um, a, a, a documentary that I had commissioned called Anne Frank Remembered uh, directed and written by this incredible um, director called John Blair, actually won the Academy Award that year. And so Meep and I walked down the red carpet together and she went up on stage where um, when John went up and collected that Academy Award, he said, ladies and gentlemen, in a land of, in a city of celluloid heroes, I want you to meet a real hero. And when they discovered who this woman was, this elderly white haired lady on the stage, the whole audience just erupted and stood on their feet to salute her. It was quite, quite something. And so this is the woman that Otto had incredible trust in, both during the time that um, the families were in hiding because they relied so much on Meep and uh, three other members of his staff who provided them with food and moral support, not just for a week or a month, but over two years, when food was strictly rationed for the Dutch and they really had to search to get food for their own families, let alone the eight people that they were sheltering. So it's been my great privilege in life to spend time with Meep Peace. Um, so I, I was talking to you about uh, Otto's moral dilemma because uh, 
When Anne was actually isolated for those two years in hiding, writing became such an enormous comfort to her. She actually wrote, when I write, I can shake off all my cares. My spirits are revived. This meant so much to her. And um, in April 1944, the Dutch um, minister for education who was in exile in London announced on the BBC, and remember the Frank family had a secret clandestine wireless set in their hiding place, which they listened to every day when the staff had gone home and there was no chance of them hearing it. They crowded around this little wireless set to listen to the BBC, it was their lifeline. And um, <clears throat> Mr. Bolkestein announced that he would like to see people who are in uh, under occupation in the Netherlands, keeping journals and diaries that could be published after the war as a record. So Anne had a new passion. Her passion for Peter Van Pels, the 16 year old boy was, was kind of waning by then. He wasn't quite up to her intellectual standard. She was finding him a little bit immature. Um, and so all her passion went into editing her diary for possible publication after the war. So she edited everything she'd written before over the almost two years that she'd been writing it and simultaneously continued to write her diary. And some of the, the most profound passages are actually when she was writing uh, between April and uh, the arrest in August of 1944. But Otto's dilemma was compounded by the fact that on the one hand, he knew his daughter wanted to be a desperately wanted to be a published author. But on the other hand, she had not written very favorably about those in hiding. And he really wanted to protect their memory because they had died so terribly. So he showed uh, uh, the little red check diary to several people that he trusted. Um, and uh, it was actually a literary critic called Jan Romain, a friend of Otto's, who read it and published a a uh, piece in the Het Perot newspaper called, entitled The Voice of a Child. It was actually on the front page of the newspaper. And on the strength of this, a publisher came forward called um, Contact. Now, it was uh, a, a, a small Catholic publisher and uh, they agreed to publish the diary on the 25th of June, 1947, uh, in a small run, relatively small run, of 1,500 copies. It was called Het Acht de Huis, uh, and, uh, which means the back house, which it was, where their hiding place was at the back and the top of the building and the prison graft, where Mr. Frank had his warehouse and offices. And they would just see how the land lay, because, to be honest, the Dutch were really wanting to move forward from the war by that time. And... Um, they were worried that there would not really be an interest in a chronicle, a particular teenage girl's chronicle of the, those uh, war years. Well, actually, by December of that year, uh, there was so much interest that there was a second edition. By February the following year, there was a third edition. Now, it's interesting because one of her very first entries in the diary, this is what Anne wrote, writing in a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me, not only because I've never written anything before, but also because it seems to me that later on, neither I nor anyone else will be interested in the musings of a 13 year old schoolgirl. So, not interested. Uh, <clears throat> the diary started taking off in other countries. And to date, uh, Anne's diary has sold more than 30 million copies. Uh, I used to say that it was the second most widely read book in the English language after the Bible. But that was, of course, before Harry Potter came along. Uh, it's been translated into more than 70 languages. And uh, a few years ago, I was walking through Bangkok Airport and uh, I actually spotted a, a copy of Anne's diary in the Thai language in Bangkok Airport bookshop. And recently I was giving a lecture and uh, someone sent me a photograph of a copy 
of Anne's diary in they, they spotted in the Ethiopian language in a market in Ethiopia. And every year there are new dramatic musical interpretations, documentaries and books about Anne's life on all aspects continuing to be created. The interest does not seem to wane. And the traveling exhibition about her life, which I'm going to tell you more about in a minute, has been seen by over 9 million people around the world. Now in 1953, Otto Frank remarried and he married um, a Holocaust survivor who survived Auschwitz called Fritzi Geringer. She had lost her teenage son, Heinz, very talented boy, multi-talented, and her husband, Eric. She miraculously survived Auschwitz along with her teenage daughter, Eva. Now, Eva and Anne had known each other from the Maveda Plain. Uh, most, both families had lived in the same development, the Maveda Plain, before both families went into hiding. Both families were betrayed and arrested and sent off to Auschwitz. Uh, so you can imagine they had a lot of common, uh, in common. And it was Eva who introduced Otto to her mother on the train station coming back from Auschwitz from one of the stops, she recognized the father of her friend Anne. Now they weren't close friends, not like uh, Susanna Ledemann I mentioned, or uh, Jacqueline uh, Van Marsen or Hannah Pitt Gosler that you saw in Anne's 10th birthday party, Eva wasn't there. They weren't close friends uh, because they were very different in personality, but nonetheless, they knew each other from the Maveda plane. So Otto remarries, a very successful marriage, and in the 1950s, a phenomenon starts happening that Otto, because of how Anne writes about her father in the diary, he starts receiving letters from teenagers all over the world. Every single letter he receives is answered. Now, bear in mind that in the 1950s, 60s, and some extent in the 70s, uh, teenagers didn't feel that they were actually being taken seriously like they are today by their parents or by their teachers. So because of how Anne wrote about her father in the diary, that he was a very kind man, a very worldly man, remember he'd worked in New York, a liberal man, a listening man, teenagers started writing to him because they felt they couldn't divulge their most intimate concerns and thoughts with their own parents. Every single letter he received was answered. And remember, not on a word processor, but on an old typewriter. And Fritzi, his second wife, helped him with this as well. Now, I was giving this lecture a couple of years ago in a New York library, and a lady came up to me afterwards and said, Gillian, I've got something to show you. And she showed me a letter that she had received from Otto Frank in the 1970s when she was a teenager and had written to him. And as she said, being a well brought up young girl, she wrote back to him to thank him for his letter. And guess what? He wrote back again. And she showed me the two letters that she had received from Otto Frank. So it's absolutely true. He answered every single letter he received. Um, a great admirer of uh, Otto Frank in the 1950s was this lady. You may recognize her from some old movies. Uh, the lady in the middle is, of course, the beautiful Audrey Hepburn. Uh, the lady on the left is Otto's uh, second wife, Fritzi, who I've just mentioned to you. And they actually live, went to live in Switzerland after they married. And Audrey also lived in Switzerland. So here they were meeting up prior to um, the creation of the movie, the George Stevens movie, The Diary of Anne Frank in 1959. And Otto and Fritzi had gone to meet Audrey to pre prevail upon her to play the part of Anne in the movie, even though she was a little bit older, but she still had that young look about her. But um, Audrey felt she couldn't play Anne and she explained this to Eva Schloss, who's uh, Otto's stepdaughter, uh, Anne's former friend, and myself when we met Audrey in London in 1991, and she became, actually became one of the very first patrons of the Anne Frank Trust when we started it. And uh, she explained that when she read Anne's diary, she was absolutely broken by it, because her childhood and teenage years had been in the Netherlands, 
uh, in not in Amsterdam, but actually in Arnhem. And her mother had been in the Dutch resistance. Her father had actually been an Irish uh, Nazi sympathizer. The family had, uh, the, the couple had divorced. And Audrey herself during the war had been running errands for the Dutch resistance as a teenager, very, very dangerous thing to do. And so she had had her own experiences, even though she wasn't a Holocaust victim, she wasn't Jewish uh, in the war. And she was broken when she read Anne's diary because she identified so much with it. And here she is explaining to Otto and Fritzi why she could not bring herself to play Anne in the movie. It would have broken her even more. Now, by 1960, people are coming to stare at the building on the Prinzengracht where Otto's uh, business was and where the hiding place had been as uh, the diary is taking off around the world. But by May 1960, that whole area is becoming very derelict. Now, at that time, in about 1960, uh, Local authorities and councils and builders were knocking down buildings, old buildings. They didn't see any value in them and they wanted to build new. And uh, there were plans to knock that whole area down. But because people were already coming like, on pilgrimage to stare across the canal to see where Anne had been in hiding, Otto actually went with a group of people to see the mayor of Amsterdam and actually prevail upon him not to knock the building down, but to preserve it. Uh, he wanted to raise the money to turn it into a museum, but this wouldn't be a backward looking museum, not a memorial as such. This would be an education center. And Otto's vision was to bring people together, young people at an impressionable age from countries around Europe. Remember, people didn't really travel so much in those days from America or from other uh, continents, but really young people around Europe to have student conferences, uh, to break down all those barriers of mistrust and intolerance and misunderstanding that had caused the terrible deaths of his own two daughters. And can you believe uh, in these first conferences that Mr. Frank held when the, after the Anne Frank house had opened, the money had been raised, it opened its doors in May 1960. Can you believe some of the first students that Otto invited were young people from Germany, the country that had uh, treated him so cruelly. And this is really only 15 years after he'd been liberated from Auschwitz. The photo that you can see uh, was taken by a very famous photographer called Arnold Levin. And this was the day of the opening of the doors of the Anne Frank House as a museum. And there he is up in the dusty old attic above the secret hiding place where Anne and Peter Van Pels had actually escaped up a ladder to spend some time alone together in the flourishing of their little teenage romance. You can only imagine what that poor man is thinking. Um, now, the first visitors to the Anne Frank house, believe it or not, they had to ring the doorbell and wait for somebody to allow them in. But of course, um, numbers started growing as Anne's diary started taking off around the world. Um, in 1976, <coughs> Anne's diary was becoming so popular that this is Mr. Frank appearing on the BBC programme Blue Peter. There he is with the presenter at the time, Leslie Judd. And she is actually holding the original copy of Anne's diary, the little Czech diary. And she's speaking to Mr. Frank, and he is responding so eloquently in his German accent about how it really felt to be the victim of racial hatred and how Anne's diary articulated so beautifully from a child's point of view, what it felt like to be that victim. Now, when I first started the Anne Frank Trust, I actually was receiving calls from teachers, believe it or not, who told me that they had um, been inspired to become teachers by seeing that interview with Mr. Frank in 1976. It was actually, he was quite an elderly man by then. He, it was only a few years before he died in 1980 at the amazing age of 1991. 
So it's a remarkable thing that this 10 minute clip, and by the way, you can actually find it on YouTube. If you Google Otto Frank and Blue Peter 1976, it'll come up and you'll hear the whole 10 minute interview. It's really inspiring. Um, this is at the time of around the first Race Relations Act in the UK. So here was a man who for the first time spoke about what it felt like to be the victim of racism, when racism really had not been on the agenda in the UK and other countries. Um, so this was quite a groundbreaking interview. And uh, a few years later, I actually met uh, the um, producer of Blue Peter at the BBC. And he told me that in that year, 1976, this was the most requested repeat item of that year. Now, by the mid 1980s, and uh, actually this photograph is taken a little bit later when the, there's been a very um, big renovations of the Anne Frank house in 1999. This is quite a modern photo. And obviously as you can see pre-pandemic because of the lines of people waiting to get into the Anne Frank house. Um, the numbers of people were building up. Of course, you, you didn't have to press the doorbell to get in by those days. Uh, you had to wait patiently in line. By the way, if you want to visit the Anne Frank house uh, when you can travel again, um, you have to book your ticket online now. And it's advisable to book it around uh, six weeks before your planned visit. If you book it too early, the tickets aren't released yet. If you book it too late, you won't get the tickets. Um, so tickets are sold online now. It's very rare that you can get in without pre-ordering your ticket online. But here you can see lines building up outside. And it was 1984 when a member of the staff of the Anne Frank House, remember it's growing, um, he was actually standing by a window and looking at the lines of people outside. And he suddenly had an idea and went to see the director. And he said, um, what if we created a mobile Anne Frank house and took it out to the world? So um, the director, Hans Westra, uh, quite liked the idea. And in 1985, um, uh, Anne Frank exhibition called Anne Frank in the World was launched at first in the uh, Vesterkirk, Kirk, Vesterkirk, Vesterkirk, which is the uh, 17th century beautiful church just around the corner from the Anne Frank house, which Anne describes, by the way, the bells from the Vesterkirk, which comforted her when she was writing her diary. So a most appropriate place to launch the exhibit. And simultaneously in Frankfurt and then um, in uh, New York as well and it starts taking off. And in 1986, it comes to London. Now, this is what the exhibition looked like in those days. Okay, it's a black and white photograph, but in actual fact, the exhibition itself was completely monochrome. It was black and white and it was huge. It was designed and built by Dutch people who are actually um, the tallest nation in the world. Um, it's to do with the dairy that they're brought up, the amount of dairy apparently that they're brought up from that for generations. They are the tallest nation in the world. So uh, it was big and uh, it's a bit of a dinosaur now when we look back at it. Uh, in fact, even the, the top pictures and captions in that exhibition, I mean, I used to have to crane my neck, uh, let alone the school kids that came to see it to, to actually read them. But it was phenomenal. It was a phenomenon of its time. And it started really taking off and around the world. And uh, thanks to my colleague, uh, who Tony knows very well, Jan Eric Doubleman, he actually literally took that exhibition off around the world uh, and made it a huge success, uh, seen by millions of people. Um, now, I mentioned to you before, this astonishing resource of photographs that we had of uh, Anne and Margot growing up through Otto's incredible photography. And people have asked me, well, how come those photographs survived uh, when the family went into hiding? Of course, there were no photographs taken while they were in hiding. But before they went into hiding, Otto actually sent a huge chest of those photographs to his family in Switzerland, and they actually took care of them. So Otto actually was able to retrieve the photographs from his family after the war. So that's why we have this incredible resource 
that um, any books you read about Anne Frank, uh, if you go to the Anne Frank House and the traveling exhibitions have this wonderful resource of photographs. So that is the first exhibition, Anne Frank in the World. Now, that exhibition came to Bournemouth in 1989, and it was so successful. It was actually housed in um, the art college, which is on the university campus, which is about uh, two miles outside the town center. Nonetheless, in three weeks, we had uh, 10,000 visitors. And um, I had been asked by my very good friend and Rabbi David Suttendorp, whose father had been a friend of Otto Frank's from Amsterdam, uh, would I actually help him bring the exhibition to Bournemouth? And so I said, yes, please, it sounds amazing. And so we formed a little committee and uh, brought the exhibition to Bournemouth. It was just incredible. And I just felt I just didn't want to let go of this incredible project. So uh, in September of 1989, we had the exhibition in April, I put myself on a plane to Amsterdam and went to visit the director, Hans, who I met, mentioned just earlier, and convinced him that they needed a British representative to keep this incredible exhibition on the road. And for my sins, I was appointed the British representative of the Anne Frank House. And then with a group of people, including Tony, uh, we got together and we formed the Anne Frank Educational Trust, as it was known in those days, as an educational charity. It all started from my desk in my study in my home in Wimborne in Dorset. And um, as they say, you know, the rest is history. Uh, when I left the trust, when I retired in 2016, there were 35 members of staff taking Anne Frank programmes all over the UK and really some of the most divisive and socially and economically challenged areas of the UK. Um, so we actually, uh, I, I mentioned to you about the photographs that fed the exhibition. These are a couple of the photographs that Otto took of his uh, lovely daughter Anne playing with her friends in the Maveda play. You can recognize the buildings there. Um, you can see the lovely and tragic Susanna Lederman on both photographs on the left wearing a dark outfit in the left hand photo and in the middle in the right hand photo she truly was one of Anne's closest friends and there's Otto you can just see the bottom of the right hand picture you can just see the shadow of his head there he is busy with his Leica camera so these are just you know some of these incredible photographs that we're able to um, furnish the exhibitions with um, Otto took a lot more photographs of his daughters than um, I ever had of my, myself and my brother uh, when we were growing up with my dad, taken by my dad's box brownie. And here's actually the launch of the Anne Frank Trust. Tony, I don't see you in the photo. I'm sure you must have been there somewhere um, at the House of Commons in 1991. Uh, so the, the, the co-founders were um, myself, Eva Schloss, who you see holding the bouquet, um, towards the left of centre of the picture in the glasses, uh, Otto Frank's stepdaughter. And then in the lighter, um, very elegant outfit, uh, two to the right is another co-founder, that's Mrs. B. Clug, who was actually a friend of Otto's in the 1960s she met him. And he actually described to her uh, how much he would love to see an educational organization in his daughter's memory in the UK. And she, she took this on as a mission. Unfortunately, uh, health problems, severe health problems got in the way. And it wasn't until the exhibition came to Bournemouth where she had a, a flat um, that uh, the whole project was revived. And uh, so here you can see some of the, the leaders of the organization and I'm sure Tony being one of the co-founders is there somewhere. So we launched it with 300 people at the um, House of Commons in November, 1991. So that's why we're celebrating our 30th birthday at the moment. Um, one of the early things we did, and bear in mind, it was still all run from my home, even though I moved to London in, by then. In 1993, during the height of the Bosnian war, um, I was being prevailed upon by Holocaust survivors that I knew. Can't we do something for the children of Bosnia uh, who are trapped in war like they were um, 
decades ago in the Second World War. They couldn't bear to see the film footage on the news. And I said, well, no, um, we are an educational organization. We're not an aid organization or a campaigning organization. What can we do? And then fortuitously, um, it was in the days of faxes. The fax, fax machine was the highest technology in those days. A fax arrived on my desk from uh, the Anne Frank house, from a colleague there who'd received, they'd received a letter from kids in uh, Bosnia under war. And they had read the diary of Anne Frank in their English lesson, in English. They were a class of 12 year olds and they wrote to the Anne Frank house an impassioned letter saying, we have no water, no electricity, no heating, these things we can bear, but we cannot bear the hatred that is going on around us. Will we ever live to see peace? And I thought, oh my goodness, perhaps we can do something with this, this incredible letter. And so I had a contact at um, on GMTV, the breakfast television program on uh, ITV, and also a contact in uh, at UNICEF and another at the People newspaper. Together, we all formed together and we started the Anne Frank Children to Children Appeal for Bosnia in 1993. Now, remember at that time, there were no emails. These were letters. These were letters and gifts and toys. And um, we sent 100,000 letters um, out to these children trapped in war-torn Bosnia from all sides of the conflict, whether they were Muslims, Croats or Serbs, with little messages, short messages from children in Serbo-Croat. And it was quite incredible and really put this really small charity, which was myself and a part-time administrator on the map. We were somewhat overwhelmed, but thanks to UNICEF, they were able to be dis uh, delivered to Bosnia. So that was something very exciting for a very new charity to be able to do and take part in. Now, um, in 1985 onwards, we started touring with big exhibitions like the one you saw. I mean, they've been updated since that one, Anne Frank and the World. But um, community exhibitions that would go to a very prominent place, venue in a city or town center. So for example, um, uh, a cathedral or a museum or a city hall. But, um, since around 2007, the whole methodology of how we've been working has radically changed. So for the last few minutes, I want to allow quite a bit of time for questions. Last few minutes, I'm actually gonna take you on a quick whistle stop tour of the world. Hope you've got your suitcases packed and to see how we work now. And basically we we'll tend to be working with much smaller exhibitions that go into venues such as schools for a period of about two weeks. And what we do is we actually train the uh, teenagers themselves to be peer educators. And I mentioned this to you earlier. Um, so peer to peer education. And here, for example, you can see this exhibition has been taken by the Anne Frank House International Department to Kolkata in India. And this was around, I believe about 2015. And on the left, you can see the teenage educator educating uh, her teenage peers about a teenager. And it's very interesting because the teenagers in India themselves made connections between uh, Anne Frank, the discrimination that Anne Frank suffered and the iniquities of the caste system in India that still endures. And here we are, uh, teenage educators in Japan uh, now, for many years, you may know that um, Anne's diary has been hugely popular. It was one of the first countries, ironically, to, to publish her diary as early as 1952. Um, but they never contextualized her experience against the Holocaust. Anne was seen actually as an iconic symbol of the suffering of children in war. And they linked her story to the suffering of children, Japanese children, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's only fairly recently, and a lot thanks to the traveling exhibitions on her life and the peer education programs, that uh, the Japanese are learning about the Holocaust, Anne's experience in the Holocaust. Uh, they stage a lot of these exhibitions in Japan, in schools, but also in shopping malls, which are considered great cultural centers in Japan. So there you see a couple of Japanese 
uh, peer educators. Uh, since 2002 in the UK, we've been taking an uh, exhibition into prisons and sort of adding panels that would be of interest to prisoners. Um, and we again here we train peer educators, we train the prisoners themselves to be our exhibition guides. And here you see a prisoner proudly wearing his uh, Anne Frank exhibition guide t-shirt, which they keep afterwards. And we have a graduation ceremony at the end of the two weeks where these prisoners are presented, who've been our peer guides, they're presented with a book and a certificate. And very often it's sometimes the first um, uh, certificate that they've had for anything so they're really proud of having been an Anne Frank exhibition guide but something we've been doing that has been quite unique also has been taking holocaust survivors into prisons to speak to the prisoners about their own experiences now here you see Eva Schloss Otto Frank's stepdaughter who I've mentioned to you earlier one of the co-founders of the trust and she's speaking in Wormwood Scrubs prison in London uh, she's been invited back about four times to speak to prisoners. You can see how engaged they are. Um, the, the woman on the right of the picture, by the way, isn't, uh, she isn't actually a prisoner because it's a male prison. She's actually a journalist covering the story. Um, but whatever survivors we take into prison, of course, now they're getting quite elderly to do this work. They always uh, introduce themselves and explain that they were in prison, which is quite a big surprise to the prisoners when they see an elegantly dressed elderly lady or man um, and explain that they were there to be killed. And they implore the prisoners to take every opportunity that's afforded them in prison, while they're in prison, to study, to take a degree, to learn a new career. And when they hear it, this from a Holocaust survivor, and believe me, you can hear a pin drop when the survivor is speaking to them, um, it really gives the prisoners a sense of perspective about their own grievances against society. Here's another prisoner, and that's, of course, Mr. Ma Nelson Mandela. And um, a, a tour of the Anne Frank exhibition uh, went to South Africa in 1994, uh, the very year that uh, of the first democratic elections. And I was very privileged to go and open the Anne Frank exhibition in uh, Port Elizabeth just a few days after the election. It was euphoric, quite a time to be there. But Mr. Mandela actually came and opened the Anne Frank exhibition in August of that year in Johannesburg. And he described to the audience how um, he had read Anne's diary as a young lawyer even before he went into prison. And he actually arranged for a copy of the diary to be smuggled into Robben Island prison and encouraged the young political prisoners to read it as a testament to the human spirit. Now that little copy of the diary fell to bits, it was so um, used and handled and read, but the prisoners, encouraged by Mr Mandela, actually set about hand uh, writing out uh, the diary by hand in their prison cells at night by candlelight so that they could continue to read Anne's diary. And this was a very dangerous act. And we don't know actually what happened to that little copy of the diary, but it's really one of the most beautiful stories of Anne's diary. And the Anne Frank exhibition continued to tour South Africa after that big traveling exhibition had finished. And in the 2000s, a small exhibition would go to schools in very impoverished schools in the shanty towns, the townships around Johannesburg and Cape Town. And again, uh, young people in those schools, this was a great opportunity for them, would be trained to be Anne Frank exhibition guides. Incredible, they, they felt a sense of pride and responsibility. And um, I'm not quite sure which one on the left, but one of these young boys on the left, he actually entered a writing competition held by the uh, American embassy in South Africa. And he wrote about what it meant to him to be an Anne Frank exhibition guide. And guess what? He won that competition. He was flown off, um, flown up, up, away to uh, Washington DC as a guest of the American embassy and treated like a VIP. He came back to South Africa, he studied, he went to university, and he is now a teacher. And that, that's all on the strength of being an Anne Frank teenage peer, peer educator. That's a wonderful story. And here we are, an Anne Frank peer educator in Kazakhstan in Central Asia. 
And you would think, what on earth would these young teenagers feel that they have in common with a little girl, a little Jewish girl who lived in Western Europe in the middle of the last century? But as you can see, uh, there's a panel from the exhibition, there's um, a young peer educator holding up a photograph and the teenagers themselves in Kazakhstan are so engaged. The Anne Frank House have been doing some incredible work around Asia, whether it's in Bangladesh, or whether it's in South Korea, in Vietnam, uh, really taking the story out there to teenagers who feel that they can identify with this young girl's story. Uh, I did a lot of work in the 1990s and early 2000s, both before and after the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. And as you probably know, still a very sectarian community. Kids still grow up actually um, going to school, either Catholic or Protestant school, living in a Catholic Protestant community or a Catholic and Protestant shops they go to. Very little opportunity to mingle and mix with the other side of the sectarian divide. But we always ensured when we took uh, an Anne Frank exhibition to uh, a town in Northern Ireland that we would invite Catholic and Protestant schools to come together to see the Anne Frank exhibition. And um, one of my proudest moments of the trust was actually in Armagh, in really in the height of bandit country, where um, after the exhibition left, for the first time ever, teenagers from the local Catholic and Protestant schools came together to produce a cross-community newspaper called Anne's Legacy, which was absolutely wonderful. And here we are in Sao Paulo in Brazil, like um, uh, South Africa, extremely polarized in terms of wealth and poverty. And this was on a community school in a favela in Sao Paulo, a very, very poor shanty town area. And um, you can see these little peer educators. They're as young as 11 and 12, by the way, these girls. And a little boy on the left. And you can see how animated they are in explaining to the man in the red tie the history of Europe after World War I that led to the rise of Nazism, led to the Holocaust, why Anne had to go into hiding. Uh, he's being... Uh, um, very, very nice because he's actually listening so intently to what they're having to say to him. It didn't worry them at all that the man in the red tie happened to be none other than the Dutch foreign minister who was on a state visit to uh, Brazil and visiting the Anne Frank exhibition. Uh, I was actually there. I'd been asked by the Anne Frank house to go and uh, help open the exhibition. So uh, I think I actually took that photograph. And um, my uh, final photo from our whistle stop tour of the world, I'm going to come back to the UK in a moment, um, was taken in Sri Lanka in Jaffna in 2016. Now, as you may know, there was a cruel 30 year civil war, very brutal, uh, going on in Sri Lanka, a very long uh, war. And this was actually one of the very first projects that was allowed up to Jaffna in the north of the island uh, when it reopened because it was closed off to visitors for many, many years. And here you see the Anne Frank exhibit in the school and you can see uh, the, the uh, young people there are actually from both sides in that long and brutal conflict from the Lankan side and the Tamil side. And you can see a young peer educator telling the story of Anne Frank. And uh, some of these young people actually decided on the strength of this that they were going to work together to create their own traveling exhibition about their own experiences in the war. Um, and here we are, uh, teenage peer educators in a, as you can see, quite a multicultural school in Camden in London. And um, th at the Trust, we work in uh, very multicultural areas um, uh, where there are uh, quite uh, did great divisions between the two communities, such, for example, as Bradford, we, again, we bring schools together from the Asian schools and the, um, in, uh, the white schools. We bring them together to the Anne Frank exhibition to learn together, um, but also in very monocultural areas. Uh, we actually work in um, regions, for example, of County Durham, where um, there is high degrees of unemployment where, you know, post-industrial areas, 
uh, where there, there was a flourishing coal, coal mining industry and sometimes they're like three generations of unemployment and very little hope and aspiration. And it's the Anne Frank exhibition being a peer guide that has given some of these young people great hope and aspiration for the future because if the Anne Frank Trust has entrusted me to, to impart this education to my peers, then I think I can carry on doing this. Um, I was going to do a short reading from my book about this topic, but I think um, I'm going to end pretty soon because to allow some time for questions. Uh, so there she is, Anne Frank, um, a young teenager who in many ways would, was just an ordinary teenager, but in many ways was truly extraordinary through what we know from her writing. But of course, to her Nazi oppressors, uh, this young girl was seen as subhuman, as untermenschen, not worthy of the right to live. But as I say to uh, all young people that I lecture to, what a boring old world it would be if we were all exactly the same and all clones of each other. On the 15th of July, 1944, Anne wrote these words. It's utterly impossible for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering and death. I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. And yet when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty will end and peace and tranquility will return once more. In the meantime, I must hold on to my ideals. Perhaps the day will come when I'll be able to realize them. Yours, Anne M. Frank. Just three weeks after she wrote those words, Anne and her family were betrayed, arrested, and began their journey to their terrible deaths of starvation and disease. But thanks to tens of thousands of educators, of human rights activists, and most importantly, of young teenage peer educators, those ideals are being realized. If I can just give a little plug to my book, a lot of stories um, that I've told you today, some of the people that you've met, like Meet Peace, uh, like Anne's cousin Buddy, like um, Audrey Hepburn, and actually many stories from around the world are in my book, uh, The Legacy of Anne Frank. So I'm now open for questions and I look forward to them. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much, Gillian. So please do, we've got a, a good uh, 15, 20 minutes. So please uh, ask Gillian questions. Uh, I had one. Um, if with the, um, like you said, with uh, when also invited, when he first opened up the um, house to of, like children to visit, like well especially like German children like does that still happen now like with children get especially to visit it or is it the um the worldwide exhibition is like the evolution of that so like, that no longer happens but now it's just the exhibition um no Ryan um there are uh, conferences uh they're particularly conferences of um and Frank ambassadors um who uh, have been trained you know their peer educators have gone on to further training uh to become Anne Frank ambassadors like we do in the UK but from around the world and they certainly have conferences. There is a flourishing education department uh, in the Anne Frank House. So it's not just tourists having their sort of like one hour tour of the house, which um, sometimes people say that's kind of had incredible effect on their lives, uh, just visiting Anne Frank's house and, and the Anne Frank House. Um, but there certainly is a, a whole program of educational activities and group visits. I mean, for example, some schools go as a group uh, to the Anne Frank House and uh, they will arrange in advance for one of the team from the education department to actually give them a tour and give them a, a talk before they actually do the tour. So there's a lot of education uh, stuff going on there. Cheers, thank you. So, so a question on the chat from Ben. Um, how do you think Anne Frank and her legacy will be remembered in years to come? 
Well, yes, um, it's interesting. And, and I guess it has to evolve, Ben, because um, we have to evolve with the times. I mean, for example, um, I know that the Anne Frank Trust in the UK, as well as the Anne Frank House, um, have been doing a lot of stuff um, online during the pandemic and reaching very large audiences through online uh, educational resources, et cetera. Um, there are new ways of presenting her story. For example, there's recently been a very good, by the way, very good uh, animated version of her diary um, produced by um, Arif, uh, uh, what's his name, Arif Fol Folk, uh, I can't remember his name, but he's an Israeli film director. Um, there are new ways of presenting her story. What we must ensure as um, Holocaust survivors in the next few years may not be with us anymore to verify the facts, we must be absolutely sure that we hold on to the truth and things are not dissipated so much that the truth gets left behind because this is this is crucial. This is absolutely, and, and in fact, all fields of Holocaust and genocide education, we must hold on firmly to the truth and make sure that it's imparted correctly. But there will be new ways of presenting her story. And another question in the chat from Joe. Um, what was the initial reception from the public of the diary in Germany and of a previously Nazi occupied states? Yes, I mean, Germany, there's always been a great interest. Um, and in fact, there, we have a partner organization based in Berlin uh, called the Anne Frank Zentrum that have uh, to some wonderful exhibitions if you ever happen to be visiting Berlin. Um, uh, but yes, uh, there was an interest virtually from day one in the diary and it's never been out of print in Germany. So um, there's always been an interest even before the establishment of the Anne Frank Zentrum in Berlin, there's always been a great interest in the traveling exhibitions. And of course in other occupied countries um, and particularly in uh, countries of the former Soviet Union, uh, when the Soviet Union was breaking up in 1990, uh, the Anne Frank exhibition was actually one of the first um, cultural programs from the West to go to Moscow and then to uh, the satellite states such as in the uh, Baltic like uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Lit Latvia which of course were occupied but actually as they emerged from the yoke of communism were actually experiencing uh, extreme nationalism as well so there were some difficult uh, challenging issues to confront there as well. And then of course, if you go down to the Balkans, to the Balkan states like Bosnia um, and uh, other states around the Balkans, the former U Yugoslavia, uh, the Anne Frank exhibition has been doing some incredible work there, Hungary, for example. So um, yes, it's been uh, to many, many of, well, most of Europe and, and of course, most of Europe was occupied. So it's been doing an incredible job there too. We've got uh, three more questions uh, already from Megan. Uh, will the death of the remaining survivors hinder the ability to educate people, for example, the prisoners who felt a connection with those mm. who've been imprisoned? Very interesting question, actually. Um, time will tell. So that's why there is so much need to present this, um, uh, present this history in an accessible way uh, without di dissipating the facts and the truth. Um, and uh, yeah, I think all the organizations that are involved in Holocaust education are thinking about the time when we don't have this incredible resource of Holocaust survivors. And even now, actually, uh, survivors that we depended on. I mean, Eva Schloss is now 92 uh, and she's actually raring to get back out touring. Um, at the beginning of last year, before the pandemic really hit, she had been in uh, a tour of the US and then she followed that up with a uh, going straight off to Hong Kong for Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, but their energy is waning. Uh, one of the prisoners we used to take, um, one of the survivors we used to take into prisons as a regular resource was Freddie Noller, um, who used to tell an incredible story, exciting story about being in the French resistance, as well as being a, a, a young Jew who was on the run. Um, he's just passed his 100th birthday. Um, and much of uh, the burden will fall on another person that we use very much, who's Eva Clark. Now, Eva Clark was actually, um, I don't know if you've come across her, but she's a wonderful speaker. She was actually born in Mothosen, uh, 
Um, and the very, very last days of um, incarceration, about three days before it was liberated, and she was hidden as a baby. So you can imagine she's already now 76, but um, she's going to carry that burden for the next decade because she's one of the very, very youngest survivors. Thank you. Um, question from Gavin. Uh, when did you first encounter Anne Frank and what was your response to reading the diary for the first time? Yeah, well, I first encountered Anne Frank um, as a late teenager. Uh, I hadn't read the diary by that time, um, but I heard a radio uh, a serialization of her diary. And then that prompted me to read it. So, um, but you know, like most Jewish people in the UK, uh, I had a connection to the Holocaust, uh, not thankfully my immediate family, but my grandparents had come to England uh, in the early years of the 20th century, leaving behind some of their relatives in Poland. And I do remember as a child, um, hushed whispers among my parents. I knew even as a child something, a great catastrophe had happened, <clears throat> something terrible. And my father was actually planning a trip to Poland, <clears throat> um, asked by my grandparents, to see if uh, there was any trace of any of their family, any trace of their, <clears throat> of anything, of the property, and of course, most of all the people. <clears throat> so I was aware, even as a little girl, that something terrible had happened. And really, <clears throat> Anne Frank came into my life in 1988 in a big way and never left it. So I'm very grateful for that. <clears throat> um, question from Ben. Um, who also adds a bit later that he, he's heard Eva Clark in person and yeah. found a very <coughs> interesting. Ben asks, uh, when launching educational projects in countries like Sri Lanka, etc., how do you go about teaching it and making it relevant for them? Have you had any projects in Burma, which I know Ben has had, had, had links to? Uh, I don't believe there's been any projects in Burma, Ben, um, because it's been a very, very difficult situation in Burma for so many years. Um, but certainly uh, in the Far East. And like I mentioned in um, India, when the kids themselves made those connections to the caste system and its iniquities, they tend to make those connections themselves. Um, so with Anne Frank, you don't need to preach about, isn't this terrible, look what happened, because she's a teenager and young people can identify with her because of the things that she writes about that are so relevant to them. You know, how you transition from a child into an adolescent and all that, you know, all the emotional, physical and mental stuff that goes with that. Um, and also the first feelings of, of romantic feelings, uh, railing against your parents, uh, sibling rivalry, um, frustration with the adults that are running the world. These are all issues that are still so eternally topical. Um, so uh, it, it's very easy for teenagers from whatever society you take it in to make those connections with Anne Frank's experience. A question from Poppy, which um, you know, is, is a really interesting one for you know, a group of talented young students we've got. Um, uh, and I think, you know, uh, you know, having worked with you and uh, you know, I think it, it's a it's a great question because you, you sort of created something from, from nothing. So Poppy asks, what advice would you give to someone pursuing a similar career to yours? That is working with charities or the trust or whatever. Uh, yes. Uh, well, very, very often my first advice would be to um, perhaps if you can get yourself in as a volunteer or an intern. I mean, when I started uh, doing this stuff for uh, the and you know, helping with the Anne Frank exhibition initially in Bournemouth, I was a volunteer when I went to see the director of the Anne Frank house, uh, and that, believe me, that took quite a bit of chutzpah, I was originally doing it in a sort of uh, semi-voluntary because I said, look, I will sell in exhibitions and I'll do it on a commission basis uh, because we haven't got the funds at the moment. Um, I would always say, just go for it. Um, just um, make yourself available if you can, even part-time in the evenings as a volunteer. 
or at weekends uh, to a cause that you're interested in and uh, start building up your connections, maybe through social media, maybe sort of joining social media sites of the charities and causes that you're interested in. And um, just believe that you can do it. Look what Otto Frank achieved with his daughter's diary. Um, people say to me often, why is Anne Frank's diary, why has it become the most well-known um, work of the Holocaust? A combination of circumstances, of course, if Meep hadn't bravely gone in and rescued the diary and then presented it to Otto, if Otto hadn't survived and Meep was able to present it to him uh, and what he chose to do with it, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't know anything about it. It would have just disappeared. Um, so it's just think about what Otto Frank as one man um, was able to achieve with his vision and his mission. And, um, and just, you know, you can do it. Anyone can, you know, you can try and do it and don't say at the end of, you know, the end of your life, I never tried. Just do what you can. And I think the opportunities with social media are very much there now. Great. We've got two questions, two last questions, which I think will, will take us neatly to, to our time slot. So firstly, from Ryan, um, in these exhibitions, are there small segments which link to similar events, such as the Yugoslav Wars, um, to help link these horrific experiences to Anne's experience in the past and, and, and more recently? Yes, well, with the large traveling exhibitions that we used to use, uh, the most recent one was called Anne Frank and You, um, everything was linked to present situations, things that are going on in the world, more recent genocides. Uh, for example, Stephen Lawrence, I know it's a long time ago now, but uh, Stephen Lawrence, uh, his dreadful murder, he was you know, similarly a teenager like Anne, we worked closely with the Lawrence family for many years. He was always uh, featured in the exhibitions. Um, with the smaller exhibitions that go into schools, um, with the constraints of space, um, there's not so much room to uh, then move into the contemporary world. But what we do do is we take a range of workshops into the schools during the period that uh, the exhibition is in a school. So there'll be a workshop, for example, on human rights. There'll be a workshop on um, uh, Islamophobia and anti one on anti-Semitism, one on um, even we've been, uh, the trust has been funded by the Department for Education to take programs on um, homophobic, transphobic and biphobic bullying into schools. So we link it to um, uh, situations of prejudice and discrimination literally across the board. Thank you. And uh, a nice, uh, a neat, quite well, not nice, but a neat question to finish with from, from Maddie. Um, do you think that there is hope that as our generation and those younger than us grow older, Holocaust denial will cease to exist due to education about Anne Frank and the wider subject of the Holocaust? Or do you think there will always be some denial, there will always be denial to some extent? There will always be people with their agenda. And um, funny enough, um, when we were marking the um, 30th anniversary event last week, uh, Lord Boateng, Paul Boateng, who um, was very involved with the Trust in its early years, and reminded me that in 1996, we took an Anne Frank exhibition to Hemel Hempstead, the town where he was born, and reminded me that uh, the neo-Nazis um, targeted every school uh, in Hemel Hempstead sent a letter to the um, to the headmaster with um, a flyer called 66 questions about the Holocaust questions and answers Well, you can imagine what that was that was actually a Holocaust denial. Um, there will always be those people with an agenda and of course, as we've mentioned before, as we move forward and I'm not talking about five years, possibly even 10 years I'm talking about 20 30 50 years hence. Um, we will uh, find that uh, without the Holocaust survivors, uh, it's really down to us to make sure that this story and its relevance continues. It, it has to, and it's people like you, uh, Tony and Claire, and everything that you're doing, uh, and I guess the Anne Frank and the Anne Frank Trust, the Holocaust Educational Trust, Holocaust Memorial Day, which attracts huge numbers of people every year, we have to work hard to make sure that the, that uh, education continues. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Gillian, for not just for your presentation, but answering this wide range of questions. Thanks to all the students um, for your questions and your engagement with, with the talk. So I think you've got a sense here of the remarkable work that Gillian has done over the last few uh, decades. Um,